Good morning, everybody. I am Pastor Kathleen, and I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us for Church Online. If this is your first time here, we would love to connect and just introduce ourselves. If you could text NEW to the number on the screen or just reach out in the comment section, one of our hosts will connect with you right away. Today, we are going to be singing songs of praise to God, reading scriptures, and we have two baptisms happening on campus, which we are so pumped about. You're going to get to hear about their stories today online. Pastor Paul is going to be continuing our Advent series, He Shall Be Called. And today specifically, he'll be diving into how Christ came as our everlasting Father. Now, let's just take a deep breath and refocus as we spend some time in musical worship to our God. Worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. We'll see what our Savior has done. We'll see how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, He. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. 
But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Of the herald angels see, glory to the newborn King, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sin. Reconcile, joyful longing nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Mark the herald angels sing, glory to the Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold Him come, offspring of a virgin's womb. Hailed in flesh, the Godhead see, hailed incarnate deity. Pleased as man with man to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Heaven-born Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all He brings, risen with healing in His wings. Mild He lays His glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give us again. Let's pray. God, we thank you that we can sing that you are faithful. And so God, in a season that can bring up so much for us, I pray that we would not lose sight of how incredible it is that by your love and that by your grace, you have come to us and you have kept your promise. And so God, I pray that for the one who forgets God, who is not feeling maybe like you are in control of their present situation, would you remind them today? Would you remind them through the word that you are their everlasting father and that God, that means that you will always come for us, that you will always show up and that you will always be faithful to keep your promise to us, amen. These are your announcements for this week. Christmas Eve services, they're coming up quick expectant arrival is what we are calling this service and it will be happening both on December the 23rd and the 24th from 7 to 8 p.m. and the Christmas Eve services are now open for registration because we have limited capacity in our auditorium please register for one of the two services beforehand be sure to register a guest while you're at it so that we can make sure we have space for all of you also open now for registration is our in-house retreat happening on January the 21st to the 23rd. 
We will be having a guest speaker and a guest worship team. And this is for everybody. So mark it off on your calendars and sign up through the link on our website. We are so excited to spend this time together as a church family. Our midweek kids and youth programs have stopped for the season, but we will, we will be having our last prayer night of this year, this Tuesday night from 6.30 to 8 p.m. in the chapel. Would you just take an hour out of the busyness of this season to focus it on seeking God? Lastly, our giving initiative this Christmas, The Ruth Project. We are supporting a refugee family as they make their way here to Peterborough. Our goal is to have $30,000 ready to help support and care for this family for their first year here in Canada. You can learn more about how to give or other ways you can support this initiative by heading to our website and clicking on the Christmas at Calvary link. If you're here on campus, there are still a few tags out on the tree in the lobby. And so take a quick look on your way out today. Lastly, those who call Calvary Church home, there are three ways to give your tithe or God's offering. Yes, please don't feel obligated to give. You can give online at our website. Just click the blue giving icon and follow the easy prompts. You can e-transfer to donations at calvaryptbo.church or you can drop it off at the main office during the week. If you're on campus, you can drop it off in the white giving boxes that are located at the back of the auditorium or you're welcome to use the ATM terminal in the lobby. We are now going to be heading into our teaching with Pastor Paul. So take notes as we look at what it means that Christ was called our everlasting father. Back in the 1500s, there was a religious battle brewing in England between the Catholics and the Protestants. Martin Luther's return to the tenets of the Christian faith protested against the Catholic Church. And this teaching actually made its way into England. Now, during the five-year reign of Queen Mary, or as we may know her, Bloody Mary, Hundreds of Protestants were burned at the stake, all because they wouldn't denounce their newfound Protestant faith and turn or maybe return back to Catholicism. Two of those martyred for their faith were Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley. You know, it's been quoted that Latimer said to Ridley in the throes of the flames, we shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England, as I trust, will never be put out. Whether this moment was the cause of the Protestant movement in England or not, I'm not 100% certain. But this candle was lit, and the flame has continued to burn. You know, it's amazing to hear stories of people who, in the face of horrific moments like this, refuse to denounce their faith in Jesus Christ, and they're willing to go through the flames of martyrdom for him. Now, I'm not here today to, dis to debate Protestantism theology vers versus Catholicism, because both sides, listen, both sides have their dark pasts. But I do respect people who will stand up for the truth of the gospel, even if it means costing them their life. As Latimer alluded to in his comment, the light of Christ cannot be distinguished. They have experienced that light in them that has convinced them that life in Christ is greater than any pain that death could bring. The Gospel of John doesn't narrate the birth of Christ like the Gospels of Matthew or Luke do, but it does give us a great viewpoint of who really Jesus is. Let me read for you in John chapter 1. I'm reading from the New Living Translation today. It says this, In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The, darkness or the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never be extinguished. I love what it says down in verse 14, of this same chapter, it says this, so the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. 
John goes on to identify this word, this light, as Jesus Christ. This passage speaks to the passage actually we are looking at today. Over the last few weeks, we've been dissecting a prophecy that was given to the Hebrew people through the prophet Isaiah, some 700 years before Christ. In the prophecy, it states that the child or a child is to be born and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. In hindsight, we know this prophecy foretold the birth of Jesus Christ, the birthday that we celebrate every Christmas. So in week one of this, he shall be called series. Pastor Kathleen looked at how Jesus is our wonderful counselor. Last week, I looked at how he's our mighty God. And this week, we're going to tackle, tackle how he's our everlasting father. Now, spoiler alert. So you may just assume that next week, we're going to be looking at Prince of Peace. But peace out, home slice, we ain't there yet. That's next week. Now, I have to admit, this concept of Jesus being our everlasting father, well, it's kind of perplexed me a bit. I believe in, I believe, really believe in the Trinitarian view of God, that God is one, but eternally exists in three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each person is fully God, and yet are distinct. Are you confused? <laughs> Rightly so. Listen, it is impossible for us to fully grasp the complete understanding of the Godhead. In fact, I'm not even sure we'll be able to grasp the totality of this understanding into eternity. But that doesn't stop me from seeing this in the scriptures as truth and believing by faith that it is so. God has proven himself to me in so many different ways. And, and so I'm comfortable in believing in something I don't fully understand yet. Now, before you pass that off as naive or foolish, we do this all the time. How many of you drive your car every day, yet you don't even know how to change the oil? Or how many of you read a history book and assume the author has done their homework and that the facts are accurate? Or how many of you take medicine that the doctor gives you without any idea of the chemical makeup, and the list goes on. Listen, we can believe that the car will work when we pick it up from the dealership because, well, that dealer has treated us well for the last three cars we bought. You can trust in the historian that he's reliable or she's reliable because of reviews of other historians. We can trust the medicine the doctor gives us and prescribes to us because, well, the last prescription worked. And again, the list goes on. So I can trust the written word of God because of how predictable it has been in the past and how much impact that word has had in my life. But if, if that's the case, how can I read a passage like this one that describes Jesus as our everlasting father? These kind of passages can be confusing. And again, I won't claim to say I fully understand this part of the passage. Even the theologians will debate it a bit. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, a preacher in the 1800s, spoke on this exact passage way back on December 9th, 1866. He opened his message by saying this, How complex is the person of our Lord Jesus Christ? Almost in the same breath, the prophet calls him a child and a counselor, a son and the everlasting father. This is no contradiction, he continues on to say, and to us, scarcely a paradox. But it is a mighty marvel that he who has an infant should at the same time be infinite. He who was the man of sorrows should also be called God over all, blessed forever. And that he who is the divine trinity, always called the son, nevertheless be correctly called the everlasting Father. And I agree with him. You see, understanding the fullness of Jesus, it's going to take eternity. But let's dive into it a tad here today and see what nuggets that we can pull out of this. First off, it describes Jesus as everlasting. The makeup of this passage is actually futuristic. Although we know from other passages, like we read in John 1.1, the passage we read earlier, that Jesus 
has always been. His humanity started some 2,000 years ago, yes, but his deity, it's always existed. See, God is fully God and fully human, all wrapped up in one. John 1.1 1, 1 stated, in the beginning, the word already existed. Another way of translating that is, before the beginning began, the word was. As I stated earlier, John describes the word as being Jesus. And so we know that Jesus is eternal. The deity of the Son is eternal. He was never created. But like I said, this verse is also futurist, is really futuristic. It's not looking in the rear view, which is exactly what the Hebrews needed at the time. Their present kingdom at that time was, had strayed from the ways of Yahweh, the God of Israel. And their exile was just around the corner. So the few faithful left needed some reassurance that Yahweh hasn't left them and that he is still going to fulfill the promise he gave them way back at the beginning of the fall of humanity. That is their hope in a coming Savior. It was what was going to happen in his time, and it would be worth the wait. In verse 7 of Isaiah 9, the prophet informs us that the government of this everlasting Father, it's never going to end. Once it is established, it will never cease to exist. His reign will be from everlasting to everlasting. It is coming. And listen, it is worth the wait. It's still the hope we have. We now have a bit more of the picture, and we know that this baby Jesus did arrive through his death, his burial, and resurrection. He did initiate his kingdom in the hearts of all who call on his name and who make, him, make them Lord of their life. This inauguration of the kingdom, it has begun, begun, but it is not yet fulfilled. More is still to come. And so we continue to wait with an eager expectation of his complete arrival and fulfillment. The thing that hangs us up in this passage, really though, is that term father. Father. Some would use this passage to try and prove that Jesus and the Father are one person, that there isn't such a thing as the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that they claim, well, maybe that it's just Jesus. But that can't be what this passage is alluding to. There are way too many other passages in Scripture that would refute that point. So how should we look at this passage? In the Jewish culture, they often use the term Father to describe uh, the founder or source of something. One commentator has stated this, among the Jews, the word father means originator or source. If you want anything eternal, you must get it from Jesus Christ. He is the, the father of eternity. And so we can easily see this in Jesus. In fact, the Apostle Paul also informs us in that opening passage of his gospel, or sorry, the Apostle John also informs us in the opening passage of his gospel or his biography of Jesus, that it is through Jesus that all of creation came into being. He says this, God created everything through him, that is the word, or that is Jesus, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The writer of Hebrews describes Jesus as the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. See, the father of our eternity is a perfect title for Jesus Christ because that is exactly who he is. I read, or I read through the entire message of Charles Spurgeon that I referred to earlier. And, and let me tell you, if you think I'm long-winded, you should read some of those old preachers of the past. They are long-winded. Anyways, one of the uh, 37 or plus points, I don't know exactly how many were in that message that Sturgeon had, struck me between the eyes. He says this, Christ is called the everlasting father because he does not himself as a father die or vacate his office. 
He is still the federal head, the father of his people, still the founder of the gospel, truth, and of the Christian system, not allowing archbishops and popes to be his vicars and to take his place. He is still the true life giver from those or from whose wounds and by whose death we are quickened. He reigns even now as the patriarchal king. He is still the loving family head, and so in every sense he lives as a father. But here is a sweet thought, he continues on to say. He neither himself dies nor becomes childless. He does not lose his children. If his church could perish, he would not be the father. How a father, how a father without a son? And this is the best of all, he says. He is an everlasting father to all those whom the father or to whom he is the father at all, if thou hast entered into this relationship so as to be in union with Christ and to be covered with the skirts of his garment, thou art his child and thou shall forever be. There is no unfathering Christ. There is no unchilding us. He is the everlasting, a father to those who trust in him, and he never does at any one moment cease to be a father to any one of these. I love what he's saying here. He keeps going this with this. He says, this morning, you have come here in trouble, but Christ is still your father. This day, you may be much depressed in spirit and full of doubts and fears, but a true father never ceases. He is, if he be a father, to exercise his kindness to a child, nor does Jesus cease to love and pity you. He will help you. Go to him. You shall find that loving friend to be your or to be as tender as in the days of his flesh. He is the author of an eternal system. As I glanced at the words, everlasting father, Spurgeon says, and thought of him as the founder of an ever-living system, I said to myself, ah, then, the Christian religion will never die out. It is not possible that the truth as it is in Jesus should ever be put away if he is everlasting father. Isn't that a beautiful picture? You see, this light that has been lit in you as a follower of Christ, it will never go out. Jesus will forever be its source of strength, hope, and life if you let him. And so we can hope in the Lord that even in the face of death, by natural causes or because of our faith in Jesus, Jesus will lead us into his eternal kingdom that will never end. It doesn't matter how bleak society looks or how dismal the church looks it will continue because the light of christ is alive and active and he is the everlasting father in a few moments you're going to witness a video or two of people being baptized who have made who are about to make a public display of their faith in jesus christ they have the light of Christ living in them, and they are willing to say to all who are watching, I am a follower of Jesus. That's exciting. Their candle will never burn out if they continue to allow Christ to be the source and the originator of that hope. May your candle burn bright today. May your candle never be put out as you lean in to the source, the originator, the Father everlasting of our faith. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you sent your Son in Christ to this earth to bring us light and hope. Be with us, I pray today continue to burn bright in us, I pray today. And may our candle be ever stronger and brighter. May we not cut off the source, but may we lean into the source that we would be fueled with the power and strength and might of our everlasting Father. Thank you, Jesus. We commit all of this into your hands. Fill us anew and fresh today, I pray. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Hi, my name is Carter Seuss. I'm 17 years old, and today I'm getting baptized. I came to Calvary Church around the age of nine with my family after we moved from Hamilton, and we've called this our home church ever since. I'm involved in pretty much all aspects of the church. I do youth nights on Wednesdays. I help in the sound booth with small groups and worship. I do the same with junior youth as well. And on Sundays, I'm in the back doing the visuals and the slides, and I kind of just kick around the church whenever I can. I came to faith in Christ um, I'll say a couple different times. At the age of four, I, I always asked questions on why we were always going to church on Sundays and didn't really fully grasp it. And so one night with my parents, we kind of went over and talked about how Jesus died for our sins and uh, that he wants to be our friend and our savior. So I kind of accepted him there, but it wasn't until the age of nine that I fully understood, um, I guess not understood God, but understand his goal for us and what he asks us to do. And that's when I truly say I accepted him. I would encourage them with just saying to have peace with God and know that he has your whole plan in his hands. I think of Jeremiah 29 11, whenever that question pops up and it says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper and not to harm you and plans for your future. Uh, this gives me a sense of peace knowing that uh, I have all my plans in God's hands, that he has control over my life, especially now when I'm going off to school. And so I hope that that can rest in your heart and give you a sense of peace as well. My name is Rachel Rogers. I'm 13 years old and I've been coming to Calvary Church for five years with my family and today I'm getting baptized. I've always grown up knowing about God um, and when I was younger, you know, I made that decision when I was eight to accept Him. But over the last year, I feel like I've really been um, just growing closer to Him. And I've started, we've started a Bible study with my friends and that's really just helped shape my faith and just build it and become who I am today. Um, I decided to get baptized because I felt that God was just telling me that, that that is what I needed to do and that was his plan and he was just giving me a little push and he wouldn't leave me alone about it. There have been times where I felt like I'm too young to just be baptized or you know like make that connection with faith or take that step or do that thing but really I know I'm not too young and um, you know nothing can stop me from it age or anything else. I just feel like today I want to make that decision. Rachel and Carter, we are so excited for you. Please know that we are standing with you in your corner, cheering you on today and every day after. There is nothing more exciting than hearing stories from others on how God is speaking, interacting, and transforming their lives. I hope that you were encouraged by their stories like we were, and also by Pastor Paul's teaching today. We really want to make sure that you don't just hear the word and then miss out on what happens when we go and we live it out practically. Head to our website and click the Next Steps tab to see some practical ways that you can move forward in your relationship with God. And please, at any point, never hesitate to reach out to any one of us so that we can support you in moving closer to Jesus. Again, do not forget, register online for Christmas Eve and our in-house retreat. You can go to our website and click the Calvary at Christmas link for all that is happening this season. Have a great week.